So let's get started. Okay. Hello and uh, welcome to the discrete mathematics course. Uh, the course is called discrete mathematics for application and algorithm development and uh, it will be one just half a semester so like six seven lectures and therefore we'll have to be quite intense in our um, explanations. So um, today we'll start with the first part of our material and um, about all the organizational things I, I think I will just post them in the group chat in the general channel on Teams. So you can see there you, uh, probably you are all connected to this and um, we'll have uh, videos published somewhere, we'll have uh, all the home assignments and stuff like that also available for you. So the outline of the course is to provide a background of discrete mathematics and computational complexity ideas useful for data science for data analysis. And uh, we have a very limited time for this course, as I've already said, so we have to choose some simple central topic to be used as a running example. And uh, the first of these topics will be Boolean logic. So um, we are going to remind the basics of it. Before that, I would like to speculate a bit about why we should choose this as the, our basic say, core a topic of the course, well, because Boolean logic is one of the generic things in complexity theory. So many things which uh, arise in different areas of uh, applications. We'll see some about graphs. Uh, you can also think about some applications in genomics. I don't know microbiology, about some um, algorithms on big data. Uh, actually, these things can be expressed in terms of Boolean logic. While it's quite simple, you can re-express uh, your, say, real, real world things in Boolean logic and therefore it's going to be some like a central thing. Well, this can sound vague by now, but we'll see the examples in the future. So probably most of you heard something about Boolean functions or about classical propositional logic. So Boolean functions operate on the simplest non-trivial set, zero and one. So if you have only one element, nothing interesting could happen. But if you have two, well, of course, the functions could have several arguments, so it's not just from one bit, but you can have a string or word of bits. And of course, by this, you can represent virtually anything. So anything in the computer is finally encoded by zeros and ones. And the, for, formally speaking, this nary Boolean function is a function from uh, several Boolean arguments to one Boolean argument. Again, on the right, you could think about several bits, but then the function is just split into, say, k functions, yielding the first bit, the second bit, etc. So this is quite a general setting. But this is just the mathematical notation. So this cross is, uh, St. Andrew's cross is the Cartesian product. So on the left, you will have k n tuples of bits, so n bytes. Uh, and a Boolean function is a finite object. It means that this can be represented by a so-called truth table of uh, two power n rows. So what does this basically mean? So in, say, if you've heard about, say, studied in mathematics, calculus, analysis, uh, stuff like that, uh, in math, usually functions are infinite objects. And uh, there is a problem of, say, approximating them by something finite. Here, uh, formally speaking, you can fully define your Boolean function by a finite table, but the problem here is that the input data for the Boolean function is just n, so it's relatively small. And uh, the mm, complete description of the Boolean function, if you try to define it by just a truth table, so explicitly, is exponentially large. And this is going to be a typical gap in practice in complexity theory, that something which is exponential is very big. Well, because usually n, well, it's, I said it is small, but it's not that small. So it's the amount of data you have in your as your input. It could be big data. If you exponentiate it, you will get something astronomically large. So in practice, so theoretically, it's a finite object. But in practice, you couldn't keep it in your memory or operate with it just uh, as uh, uh, as an explicit definition. And the, all the what we are going to talk about in the next is going to be thinking about how uh, this can be made more efficient for real practical purposes. So uh, the total number of n Boolean functions is even bigger, is double exponential. 
Well, why that? Because here you have two to power, two power n because each uh, so each row is corresponds to a concrete input, and we have n bits. Each bit can be zero or one, so we have to multiply it, and we'll have two power n. And here for each row we have either zero or one, so we exponentiate it twice. So again, say enumerating all boolean functions for relatively big n's is absolutely meaningless. You couldn't do it in practice. So, for example, if you have four binary four uh, arguments, then you will have sixteen binary. Uh, yeah. So, uh, yeah, we have four unary and sixteen binary boolean functions. But if n grows, then this function grows very, very, very quickly. The only interesting unary boolean function is actually negation, which flips the value. Uh, the other one, so there are three other ones. There was constant zero, constant one, and identity. They're trivial. So for binary functions, we have 16 possible, as I said, and there are several interesting ones which correspond to usual logical operations. Well, these are logical operations which are think, mm, use useful for classical logic, uh, but uh, uh, the meaning, of course, is a bit different from what we are used to in uh, natural language. So we have conjunction or and, we have disjunction or, so it's non-exclusive or. If both are true, then or is also true. And we have implication, which is if then. So here are the truth tables. Let's take a look at the truth table for implication. It's uh, maybe the most interesting one. You see that false, from a false premise, you can uh, imply anything. So if x is zero, then x implies y is true. In particular, fal uh, false implies true, and false implies false. This means that if uh, you have your x is false, then you you know th th this is always true. And the only situation where the implication is false is when um, your premise is true and your conclusion is false. So if you suppose that x is true, then y should be also true. If x is false, you don't require anything. Again, conjunction is true only if both are true, and disjunction if at least one is true. So these are the standard things. Uh, as I said, that this meaning of implication is roughly not the same as usually people think about of implication in natural language. In natural language implication, people usually think about something relevant. So, for example, if I say that if 2 plus 2 equals 5, then I don't know, Volga flows to Caspian Sea. Uh, this is mathematically true, but in natural language, we usually do not regard it as true. We regard it as something like meaningless. But this is the classical uh, Boolean region of implication. And these guys form a complete system of, the bo of Boolean functions in the following sense, that any other Boolean function, not only a binary one, but of any number of arguments, can be represented as a composition of these. For example, this is the representation of the majority function. So we have a majority function of three voters. Uh, what does it mean? So we have three people who vote for or against something. And if at least two of them vote yes, then our answer is yes. Otherwise, it is no. And here is the Boolean formula which represents it. Of course, we can make it for bigger than three. The formula will become larger. Actually, this is an, a redundant system, so we can do, say, Oh, having only conjunction and not, or implication and negation, for example. All of them are okay, because other others are expressible. Uh, so, such representations are formalized by Boolean formulae. So, if we uh, express some function using, uh, say, well-known Boolean functions, which are in the list, then the result is a Boolean formula. And formally speaking, again, there is a bit of uh, formalistic bureaucratic syntax here uh, that the set form of all uh, Boolean formulae is uh, defined over a set of variables which are de denoted as bar. So, for example, here variables are x, y, z. But again, formally speaking, we usually have an infinite countable set of variables just in order to have a fresh variable at hand at any time. So, suppose that we always have new variables we can use. And uh, you have variables. We have these constants, which represent 0 and 1. And in Boolean logic, they're usually denoted by bot and top. Uh, it's just the same for 0 and 1. And now we have 
uh, complex formulae. So we can take it to formula, we can make a conjunction, a disjunction, implication, and a negation of one formula. And uh, this is a subtle difference between the syntax and the semantics. So these uh, signs, conjunction, disjunction, implication, they denote Boolean functions. They are, they are real functions on uh, Boolean values. Uh, but also, um, they uh, here they are just formal symbols. So a formula is not a function. A formula is a formal expression. So this expression is written just as a finite string of symbols, and it represents a Boolean function in a natural way. So uh, this representation is, of course, not unique, because you can... Uh, uh, express the same function in many ways. You have a finite number of, so if you have n values, for example, just trivial example, you have just x. This is the function which takes one value and returns it. But you can also write it as x or x. It's equivalent to x, but formally speaking, it is not the same formula. And deciding equivalence is, could be not an easy task. It's of course possible, you can just compare the truth tables, but this is inefficient because you have exponential grow up. So we shall consider Boolean formulae as logical formulae, and they represent some sort of logical expressions or propositions. They represent some logical truth. And the classic example, so this is syllogistics, so going back to Aristotle probably, uh, that, for example, if it is raining, then there are clouds in the sky. There are no clouds in the sky, therefore it's not raining. And this can be represented as a Boolean formula. R is for rain, C is for clouds. These are value variables. You see, they are black boxes. We do not go inside and we don't, don't try to understand what does rain mean or clouds mean or what is sky. But uh, here, these are just atomic propositions. And this uh, is a formula which represents uh, the idea of uh, this reasoning, which is informally presented above. So we have two premises, that is, R implies C, rain implies clouds, and we have a negation of C, and this implies a negation of R. And this formula is true for any values of R and C. So it represents, a, it also represents a Boolean function with two variables, but this function is just constant one. So it's a formula which is generally true, and such formula are called tautologies. You see that tautology means that it's something well trivially true. It's uh, uh, the truth of this thing does not depend on the meaning of R and C. We do not go inside these atomic uh, propositions. We just take them for basic atomic elements. But having this, we uh, have this uh, as a tautology, as something which generally has a uh, true inside. And uh, checking whether now we're going to uh, algorithmic questions. So this was there were, there were just definitions. Uh, by the way, if you have questions or some comments on misunderstanding, then please ask them during the lecture. It's okay to interrupt me. Uh, it's also I think very very valid for zoomers. Uh, there was only one zoomer here, so it's okay. Um, so uh, now we're going for algorithmic questions. So we want to well, the first thing we could think about is how to decide whether a given, a given formula is a tautology. So we have a formula and uh, the question is whether it is generally true or it can be falsified on some input data. And this is algorithmically decidable. So uh, algorithmically decidable, well, we are going to have some better formalisms based on Turing machines of this notion. But by now, of course, all of the people now know that there are programming languages, there are computers, and on, if you can write down an algorithm in your favorite programming language, like Python or Haskell or something like that, then the problem is uh, called algorithmically decidable. So this is not precisely a formal mathematical definition, because it relies on uh, the language or the computational equipment you choose. But there is this what's called church Turing thesis that there are many Turing complete languages and computational models, and they are all equivalent. So if you can write a program in Python, you can retranslate it into C or to anything else, and it will give you a program there. Uh, so why is it algorithmically decidable? Well, the trivial algorithm is just to substitute all possible values for zeros and ones for the variables and compute the result. 
So just, just write down the whole truth table of the formula, and this will give you the answer. If there are no zeros, then this formula is a tautology. If not, it's not a tautology. However, this requires exponential time for execution. So uh, you have to check two power n possible what they call truth assignments, so just assignments. So an assignment is literally an assignment of values to variables. So for it's a table for each variable you assign 0 or 1. And there are two power n possible assignments, and uh, each assignment should be checked. So checking is trivial. You substitute them and you compute the formula. This can be done quite fastly. But uh, the number of assignments is exponential. And the general question is, could there be a fast algorithm? Uh, so the spoiler is that this is unknown to the humanity by now. But we'll did speculate around this a bit. Also, uh, there is a dual notion of a satisfiable formula. So, um, if we're talking about um, general truth or tautologicity of formulae, uh, this means that these formulae are uh, just uh, well, general truth. They are all true for all the variable assignments. And if uh, the dual notion is the notion of satisfiable formula. It means that there exists at least one assignment which makes the formula true. So if general truth corresponds to the idea that something is a valid, universally valid logical principle, uh, then satisfiability means that there is a state of art, a state of the world, which uh, satisfies this. So you, you, this theory is not contradictory. You're, can have a formula, a set of formulae, uh, which uh, has a sort of model satisfying assignment. And a, a formal definition of Boolean formula is satisfiable if it's true for at least one assignment. And this is called a satisfying assignment. So a satisfying assignment is just an assignment of zeros and ones to Boolean variables, which makes the formula one true. So a formula is a tautology if all assignments are satisfying, satisfying ones, and the formula, the formula is Satisfiable is there is at least one satisfying assignment. And this is the duality. Uh, so this is an important principle to understand how negation uh, makes, uh, dualizes satisfiability and uh, tautologicity. So a formula is a tautology if and only if its negation is not satisfiable. Uh, this is something to ponder about a bit, but uh, it's actually a trivial thing. So on the left, what does it mean to be a tautology? It means that there is no assignment which gives you zero, right? But if A becomes zero, then not A becomes one, because negation flips the Boolean value. So it means that if there is no assignment which makes A zero, then there is no assignment which makes not A true, one. And this means it's not satisfiable. And all these, of course, equivalences, vice versa is also the same. So this means that if we can, uh, all, any algorithm for satisfiability also dualizes to an algorithm for tautologicity and vice versa. So these are dual notions. Uh, in uh, This is uh, just a matter of convenience. And uh, in traditionally in logic, uh, people are mostly interested in uh, tautologicity, because they say that they want to logic this, uh, the science of uh, universally valid principles, universally valid logical theorems. And a theorem is something which should be always true. And uh, in complexity theory, uh, mostly computer science, people think about satisfiability more. Why? Well, matter of tradition, but also satisfiability is uh, something which closely related to problems of search inside data. So when you are talking about, say, trying to find something, which, what can you find? You find uh, mm, objects which should have some properties in the easiest setting, but it's actually quite general. We'll see how it generalizes. In, the, in this setting, uh, the property can be expressed as a Boolean formula. And finding an object which satisfies it is exactly finding a satisfying assignment for this formula. And it's OK to have only one assignment. And usually, we're not talking about tautologicity. Tautologicity would mean that our specification, our condition is satisfied for any object, 
usually it's not the case, of course, but uh, we are eager in finding at least one object which satisfies our form. So this is uh, maybe a more fancy expression of that. Yeah, by the way, I, I will post on the slides on the web, so it's not need to, to take pictures of them. I think they're already somewhere available, but I, I will tell about this later. Uh, so uh, it's a very, very general model example of situations where we seek for existence of objects. And it's the same which I said just now. So formula A, uh, so it's not the same A, by the way. So here we talk about A, but here we realize that we talked about not A, but of course this is interchangeable. Uh, so we seek for an existence of an object with given properties. And our, in our model, the properties are Boolean formula mm -hmm. and the, sorry, and the um, Mm. Object is the assignment. So it's a model example. Looks quite trivial, but in, indeed it's very general. We'll see. It. So um, now let's go a bit into Boolean formula of specific forms. So in general, a Boolean formula could be quite arbitrary. It could include uh, operations of uh, Boolean nature in any combinations. But uh, well, they would have a special form. So a bit of syntactic definitions again. A literal is a variable or it's negation. So in general, negation can be applied to arbitrary formula, but this is just a trivial thing that we apply it to literals. It's not x or it's written as x with the overline. It's just for convenience for the size of the literal to be the same. An elementary conjunction is just a conjunction of literals, for example, x or, and not y and z. And a disjunctive normal form, or DNF for short, is a disjunction of elementary conjunctions. So uh, how can you think about a DNF? Uh, it's, uh, so uh, each conjunction enforces the variables to have specific values. So if this is true, then uh, X should be one, Y should be zero, and Z should be one, right? And the DNF is uh, a matter of choice. So you can choose among several of these constraints. So either you say that this, should, this assignment should be work on that or that. This uh, elementary conjunction is not required to include all the variables we have. So for some variables, it can make no choice. It can just say it's arbitrary. It's a d d DNF. And dually, conjunctive normal form, or CNF, is a conjunction of elementary disjunctions. So uh, here we have this example. So what does this mean? It's a, the CNF is a sort of finite set of constraints. So each uh, elementary disjunction is a constraint on our uh, variables, and they should be satisfied simultaneously. Thus, checking satisfiability for DNF is quite easy, because if we manage to satisfy at least one elementary conjunction, we satisfy all the DNF because of the disjunction. And checking an elementary conjunction for satisfiability is uh, actually trivial, because it, 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 stuff like that, this elementary conjunction, it's satisfiable if and only if it's just non-contradictory, if we don't have X and not X simultaneously. Then we can satisfy it. So for DNF, satisfiability is easy. Mm -hmm. And for CNF, it's an untrivial problem, which we shall see. And dually checking satisfiability, so checking tautologicity for CNF is easy. Because uh, if at least one uh, elementary disjunction fails to be a tautology, then everything fails. Mm -hmm. But it's uh, uh, easy to, um, uh, to, to have this uh, at hand. So uh, for DNF, checking uh, tautologicity again is hard because you have to check that uh, the, the disjunction and uh, you can, for some very values, you can have one of them true for some other, another one true, so it's a trivial task. And these elementary disjunctions or conjunctions are called clauses. This general term for this elementary thing. So we have literals, we have clauses, and we have a normal form formula. And there's duality. You have either DNF or CNF. Uh, so uh, they're trivial cases. 
Uh, so uh, DNF can have no clauses. It's a degenerate situation. And it's an empty disjunction. So empty disjunction is uh, regarded as being false, zero. Why? Because a disjunction, if you extend your disjunction, you add more possibilities for the formula to be true. And therefore, the starting point should be just false. And then you add new clauses, and they make your formula easier to be true. For CNF, the empty CNF is true, because CNF is about adding constraints. So if you have no constraints, anything satisfies your formula. When you add new elements into the big conjunction, you make it harder to satisfy. The longer the CNF is, the harder it is to, sati to be satisfied. Okay. So it's like that, that a DNF, a DNF clause adds possibilities and the CNF clause imposes constraints. So any Boolean function can be represented by a so-called so full or complete DNF in which each clause contains all the variables. And this uh, can be obtained from a truth table. So suppose this is a truth table. For each line, we have 0 or 1. And now we take all the lines which have uh, 1. So how can you satisfy this A? How can you make it true? Well, either you should put all of them 0, or you put x equals 1, y z equals 0, or you put all of them 1s, or you put 1, 0, 1, right? Each of these formulae represents uh, a function which is true only on, on one row. So say the first one is true only if all the variables are false. And then you make a disjunction of them. And this is a DNF. By the way, this is the proof of uh, completeness of a system where we have conjunction, disjunction, and negation. So if we have these three Boolean functions, then we can represent any Boolean function just by this complete DNF. Mm -hmm. So, um, okay. It's a full DNF or a complete DNF. So, uh, in uh, other disjunctive normal forms, you can omit some of the uh, clauses, uh, some of the literals in the clause. So, for example, here you see that this is not Z and this is Z. So, instead of these two clauses, you can just take A, X and not Y. And you unite them into one. And this makes your DNF shorter. So the full DNF can be very large. So if your formula is not, it could be sparse. So if it has uh, not so many rows with ones here, then this is, uh, the DNF can be uh, easily written. But if there are, say, most of them are ones, then the DNF will be very large. It could have exponential size. The full DNF. As I said, it's not the optimal one. So these are shorter versions of that which is equivalent. This shows that this is a complete set of Boolean functions. And moreover, the, there are these uh, funny things which are called De Morgan laws, which you can express conjunction in terms of disjunction, for example. Because the negation of conjunction is disjunction of negations. How to satisfy, so if you want to dissatisfy conjunction, it's sufficient to falsify at, at least one of them. Mm -hmm. So this is the uh, uh, the negation. And uh, um, uh, therefore, if you have just a conjunction, you can dualize it using negation by De Morgan. And uh, this means that already negation and disjunction, because dual in negation and conjunction all already form complete systems. In particular, implication is expressed in the following way. It's not A or B, or it's the negation of A or not B. Recall that the implication is false in only in one case, when A is true and B is false. And this avoids it. It says it's not the case. Or here you have say, you can say that if your conclusion is true, implication is true. If your premise is false, implication is also true. A DNF can be translated into a CNF by distributivity. And one can also construct a full CNF 
from the truth table by excluding the zero lines. So again, in the same example, what we have here, now we're thinking about zero lines. So as I said, uh, CNF is about adding constraints. So each constraint will rule out one line with zero. So see here, for example, you have this line, the second one, and it, it should be avoided because here it is zero. And it says that either X should be true or Y should be true or Z should be false. We avoid zero, zero, one. We should not have it. Here we say that either X should be true or Y should be false or Z should be true and etc. And each constraint rules out one line with zero. When we rule out all these lines, we get the formula which represents Boolean function A. And we make a conjunction of Boolean. Now about satisfiability. As I already said, if a formula is given in disjunctive normal form, that checking its satisfiability is a trivial task. So recall that a DNF is a big disjunction. We check that in this disjunction there should be at least one satisfiable clause. If we find a satisfiable clause, we take this satisfying assignment for this clause, the clause is going to be true. And if a disjunction has at least one true element, then the whole disjunction is also true. And a clause is uh, satisfiable if and only if it is consistent. That means that it does not include both X and not X. So if a clause includes both X and not X, we'll have X and not X, which is false, and the clause is going to be false. Uh, it's not satisfiable. But if the clause does not include it, it is satisfiable. Because just there are for each variable, there is no more than one literal. And this literal is either say y or not y. And we produce the corresponding satisfying assignment. And the, the clause is going to be satisfiable. Therefore, the whole DNF is satisfiable. And this algorithm is efficient. So its running time is not exponential. We don't have to uh, say brute force over all assignments. We just consider clause by clause. So the number of clauses is uh, roughly the length of the DNF. And for each clause, again, we consider just the length of the clause. We take a look at all the variable literals and ask whether it is consistent. For CNFs, satisfiability is a non-trivial question, and we'll discuss it in the future. And translating from CNF to DNF does not help, because this translation could increase the size exponentially. And uh, therefore, it's meaningless. So you could do it by distributivity of disjunction over conjunction, but uh, the as you know from school algebra, when you open up the brackets, your length could, extend. It could be bigger and it could be bigger exponentially. Again, all these problems are decidable. So the, there are, are algorithms. Because always you can just, as a sort of um, backup plan, you can just take the truth table and uh, find all the stuff. But uh, this is not efficient. It's exponentially hard. So, this is the uh, set of our definitions which we are going to have in our um, today's lecture. If there are any questions about this, please ask them. Oh, sorry for the people who already know this, because this is okay. What means it's finally consistent on that? Well, uh, how to satisfy a disjunctive normal form? It is a big disjunction, right? If you satisfy at least one of the clauses, you satisfy the whole disjunction. So you need to find a clause which is satisfiable. Mm -hmm. But how a conjunction of literals could be satisfied? Uh, if there are both x and not x, it couldn't be satisfiable. Because x should be simultaneously 0 and 1. But if there are no, there is no such pair, then it's satisfiable. Because, for example, you take this clause, say here, the first clause, you have not x and not y and not z. You just put all the zeros and you are fine. And here you put one zero zero. So the algorithm works as follows. It's, it takes, it looks at the DNF. It considers clause by clause. And for each clause, it checks whether it has both X and not X. If it has, it goes to the next clause. If not, it says, okay, it's satisfied. So in one little uh, conjunction inside of between uh, DNF. Yes, uh, we need to have both X and uh, not X. Uh, if we have it, it's a bad case. It means that it's yes, not satisfiable. Yes. 
So in one bracket, like? In one bracket, yes. It diff uh, it's is the, the, it possible like, to have X and not... Formally, yes. Why not? Ah, okay. Because well, what is an elementary conjunction? Is a conjunction of literals. X is a literal, not X is also a literal. Yeah, okay. But the, the, the thing here is that it's, it's close to be trivial, because such clo clauses, they basically should be ruled out. The, the trick about satisfiability for DNF, that satisfying all the clauses is independent, because this is junction. If you satisfy one of them, yeah, yeah, yes. And for CNF, it's a matter of satisfying a set of constraints simultaneously. And therefore, it's, it's hard. So uh, you, in a CNF, you have a list of conditions, which are in a conjunction. So you should satisfy all of them. And therefore, you cannot just you cannot make your you you, you cannot separate your task into say parallel tasks. You have to do it in the, in the same time. And this is why it's, it's hard. And we'll see it. So um, as I said, uh, the naive algorithm which uh, just uh, writes down the true table and finds out whether it's satisfying clause is inefficient. It's exponential in its running time. So we're going to have some extra logic. So in logic, people usually, so again, let's return to say this example, uh, which is somewhere, mm, yeah, somewhere here. So this is a formula and uh, logicians uh, regard it as a tautology, as a general, generally valid principle, or we can say more, say, fancy, it's a theorem of classical propositional logic. And uh, there is the difference between the, the approach of Boole, who considered it algebraically, and the approach of, say, ancient Greeks, who considered it logically. So from the point of view of, uh, say, Boole, this is uh, just a tautology. It means that any assignment is a satisfiable one, is a satisfying one, sorry. And uh, this means that you just consider all possible zeros and ones and count it. And here's it trivial because it's just four possibilities. But from the more, say, ancient point of view, a theorem should be proved. And the proof is uh, some sort of, well, reasoning. Uh, some text which c convinces you that this is true. And a formal proof is formal reasoning. So it's a list of uh, applications of uh, rules. And uh, in classical propositional logic, these rules are like model spawners. So if you establish A, you establish that A implies B, then you deduce B. And this is a deductive approach to finding. It may sound harder than the, say, Boolean approach that you just put on in zeros and ones, but uh, there, is, there are certain virtues of a uh, logical or deductive approach. The first virtue is that if we go beyond classical logic, classical propositional logic, we do not have this nice uh, uh, thing as uh, Boolean assignments. So, for example, if we go to logics with quantifiers, like for all and exists, we cannot just uh, make our formula true by just uh, assigning some variables. Because uh, then, you, for if you, for example, consider formulae on natural numbers, the infinite number of them, you cannot just check all of them. And also for non-classical logics, this is the case. But the other thing is that, as we see, that uh, checking all the Boolean assignments is hard. It's exponential. And the de de deduction could be could provide a more succinct way of proving something. So again, we uh, would dualize. Uh, so uh, in logic, uh, we usually uh, check that the formula is a tautology or prove it by proving it in the classical propositional calculus. So there is a logical system, a deductive approach. So you prove your formula by uh, some sort of reasoning. And uh, in this course, we're going to, so this is probably you have heard about in some courses in discrete math or logic. And in this course, we dualize. Uh, we're going to consider a dual situation. We're going to disprove satisfiability by what is called resolution method. So by duality, proving that A is a tautology is equivalent to disproving satisfiability of the negation of A, right? So we are going to so we are going to be on the negative side. Uh, we have a formula which will be a CNF, and we try to find contradiction. So we are going to we have what is a CNF? A CNF can be considered as a list of clauses, a list of constraints, right? 
a list of something which we consider as our hypothesis, as our say, theory. And uh, we're going to reason on that, which means that uh, we shall deduce new clauses from older ones using special rules of inference. And uh, if we manage to uh, get ourselves to contradiction, which is the empty clause, then uh, we, are, we say that, okay, we fail, and this means not satisfiability. If not, then we'll say, okay, so the formula is satisfiable properly. So, as I said, it's, the resolution is applied to formulae in CNF, and the only rule is resolution, which generates new clauses from already existing ones. So, this is A and or not of B, if and B or P, then we can deduce A or B. So, this a rule of inference can look not so Aristotelian as other rules, but let's take a bit of a look on that. So, suppose that A is empty. What does this mean? We will have no A here, we will have no A here, just B. And here we have a presupposition that P is true. And we have this not P or B. It's an implication. So, this guy means that P implies B. We had this expression. So this means that if you have P and you have P implies B, then you will have B. Okay? So this is the rule which is called modus ponens. If P and P implies B, then B. Ah, uh, not P or B. It's the same as P or B. It's, we had this equivalent. Okay. And here we have also A. So another possible case that not P is satisfied, but A is satisfied. But if A is satisfied, then A or B is also satisfied. So what is the status of this rule? Of this rule, the status is as follows: that if we have a satisfying assignment, which satisfies both clauses on top, then it satisfies the clause on the bottom also. Why? Because we can consider two cases. So how can this guy be satisfied? Either we satisfy A then, of course, we satisfy A or B, or we satisfy P. But if we satisfy P, then P is true. If, we, if P is true, then not P is false. And therefore, the second clause is satisfied via B. It could not be satisfied via this second one. So it would be A or B satisfied. So what is happening? We add new clauses, but satisfying does not ruin. So if we have a satisfying assignment, these new clauses do not make it false. So adding new clauses using the resolution rule actually makes an equivalent CNF. It adds new clauses, but these clauses do not make our CNF false. They do not change its truth values. Because uh, old satisfying assignments survive, and new satisfying assignments could not appear because they have all old constraints. They still prevent from them being true. So why do we need that? We don't change our truth, truth of our CNF in any way. But we change, uh, we make our CNF bigger. Yes, and uh, no, no, not, no, it's not going to be complete. But it's going to uh, be sort of what's called saturated. Uh, it means that we add new clauses in attempt to up, up, obtain contradiction. So A or B can be empty, and at some point, for example, if both A and B are empty, what does it mean? It means that we have P and we have not P, just as two clauses. And this makes contradiction. Because if we have both of them, we cannot be satisfied. So we are aiming to contradiction. So the contradictive clause is the empty one. And it's obtained by resolution from P and not P. It's the only way to obtain it. And if we have P and not P, then our global CNF could not be satisfied. It's contradictive. It includes both P and not P. And this is the theorem, which is called the soundness and completeness theorem. So a CNF is not satisfiable if and only if one can obtain the empty clause by applying resolutions, starting from the given CNF. So there are two directions. One of them is easy, the other one is the theorem, actually. So what is the easy one? The easy one is that if, our C, if, if we can obtain the empty clause, then our CNF is not satisfiable, it's the if direction, right? So why? Because if we had a CNF, suppose it is satisfiable, then anything we can add using resolutions is also satisfied by the same assignment. 
But this would mean that we have satisfied the empty clause. But the empty clause could not be satisfied because it's P and not P. So this is the easy. But there is a different thing that uh, the, uh, if we are not satisfiable, no, no, if we, yeah, if we're not satisfiable, then we can obtain the contradiction using this method. And this is not the case, no, not trivial, because uh, you see that uh, using resolutions, you can ob obtain contradiction. And if you obtain contradiction, it means that you are not satisfiable. But the other side is that it is, it, this method is complete, that if there is not satisfiability, if there is some contradiction, that it can be obtained using this easy method, using the resolution rule. So the if part is easy, and the only if will be proved at the next lecture. So now, having this theory, we are going to talk about uh, algorithms for uh, checking satisfiability for CNFs. So how does this algorithm work? So suppose we have this uh, soundness and completeness theorem, which is taken for granted, and we'll discuss it in the next lecture. And uh, it validates the following algorithm for checking satisfiability. So given a CNF as a set of clauses, let us saturate it by exhaustively applying all the resolutions possible. So we apply a resolution rule until we run out of all new clauses. This is a finite process. It could be exponential, but this is a finite process because the total number of possible clauses is exponential. It's finite. And the CNF is satisfiable if and only if its saturation just does not include the empty clause. Well, because if it includes the empty clause, then the saturation is not satisfiable, and therefore the original CNF is not satisfiable. If there is no empty clause, then it's not possible to obtain the empty clause by resolution, because we exhausted everything. We applied all the resolutions possible. And uh, by completeness, this means that the CNF should be satisfiable. So it works only for CNFs, just due to the nature, syntactic nature of a resolution rule. So uh, when checking that the formula is a tautology, again, dual is going to be convenient to translate it into a DNF first, and then checking uh, that uh, uh, A is a tautology, as we can say, it's the same as checking for not A being not satisfiable. Uh, and uh, if A is a DNF, then not A, well, it's uh, something very close to CNF, just by De Morgan. If you, so you have a global negation, using De Morgan laws, you push them down to the literals, and this flips a uh, disjunction conjunction, and your DNF becomes a CNF. Okay? So this means that the resolution method for, if applied to DNFs, it's a method of proving. So for CNFs, it's uh, disproving satisfiability. For DNFs, dually it's proving tautologicity. So resolution is actually a method of proving that something is true. Also, it's a du du duality. And for implications, we keep in mind that there are the following equivalences. So here you see that the implication itself is a actually a disjunction. So this means that implications of literals they also could serve as clauses in our CNF, right? So P implies Q is not P or Q. This is a CNF clause. And the negation of the implication is an elementary conjunction. So let's consider one example. Suppose we want to check this formula for being a tautology. P implies Q implies R, P implies Q, therefore P implies R. Is it a tautology? Yes, yeah, so well, let's first just uh, think about it informally. If P implies Q implies R, and P implies Q and P, then we have Q, and we have Q implies R, therefore we have R. This is true. So uh, checking this for being a tautology, if you do it brute force, you will get eight possible cases, two power three. Not so large, but we will want to apply our resolution method now. We negate, and we have to check that not A is... Uh, we check whether or not A is satisfiable. What is the negation of A? So the negation of A is uh, we have 
these uh, clauses and not R. So the premises should be true and the results should be false. And what are the premises? Say P implies Q, it's not P or Q. P is just P, R is translated as not R. And here you have not P or not Q or R. And you see that it's readily in the conjunctive normal form. Well, this probably, this should be not just equivalence, it should, it's, it's not quality, it's equivalence. We use the morgue and we translated implications, but here we have this. This is already a CNF. Sorry, is it uh, the one additional bracket in the first or maybe it's uh, It should be the bracket closing here. Sorry, so it should be closed here. So here we have four clauses, four elementary disjunctions. Two of them include just one literal. This includes two and this includes three. And we apply a resolution. So, okay, we have not P or not Q or R, and we have P. And we can resolve it to not Q or R, right? Here's easy because P is forced to be true, therefore this should, cannot be true, and we have to make this true. We have not P or R is by resolving these two guys. Because here we have Q, we have not Q, we cut them off, and also we identify these not Ps. Now we have R. Why? Because we have uh, not Q, no, we have not P or R, and we have P. Therefore we have R. And already we see a contradiction. We have R, we have not R. This is the empty clause. So this formula is not satisfiable. Right? Because it's false. It's false. It's not A. So it's, it's, it's a negation. What? Okay, so how is that obtained? We have not P or not Q or R. And here we have P. We apply a resolution to these two clauses and we get not, not Q or R. So apply resolutions, we just remove these copies of that. Here we take this and we take this. So here we have not P or Q and here we have not P or not Q or R. Again, we remove from not Q and not Q and unite everything else. I have not P or R. Now we have not P or R and we have P and we can get R. And now we have R and in the same time we have not R. This will, by resolution, give you the empty clause. The empty clause is false. What does this mean? Yes, R not R is false. So what does this mean? If we manage to satisfy these clauses, the original clauses, then we should also satisfy everything like that because the resolution rule is sound. It does not ruin truth. But then we satisfy false, but false cannot be satisfied. And therefore, the, our formula is not satisfiable. So this means that uh, this formula is not satisfiable, not A. It means that A is a tautology, right? So this is how we prove. We prove it by uh, this, by falsifying uh, the negation. So this is a proof by uh, contraposition. We say, okay, we want to prove A. Instead of that, we say, okay, suppose that A is not true, and we will lead to contradiction. So this is a pure thing. Unfortunately, in general, this saturation process can be exponential. And there will be an exercise that we will, we will show it to you. So, however, we can consider a specific case, which is called a 2CNF, where each uh, clause has no more than two literals. And their resolution method works really fast, much faster than brute force. Why? Well, because uh, if you have clauses with two literals, applying resolution also yields a clause with two literals, right? So um, why? Well, suppose you have, say, three literals in a clause, and you have three literals on one side, three literals on the other side, and you apply resolution. Let's recall the resolution rule. So uh, here it is. Suppose this is three literals, this is three literals. 
This means that A is three literals and B is, A is two literals and B is two literals, right? So there's three, one is, of them is P or not P, and there are two more. When we apply a resolution, then in the worst case, we'll have four on the bottom. So if this is a blow up. If we have a three CNF, which means that we have a CNF where you are allowed to have three literals in your, uh, in your clauses, then applying resolution, you will get four, then you could get five or six, and so on and so on. And when you do this, then your resolution will give you blow up. You know, we have more and more clauses with more and more literals in them, and uh, the total number of these clauses could be exponential. Uh, we will have a, such an example in our exercises. But suppose now we have only two. What does this mean? It means that here A could be no more than one literal. Because there is one which is P, we remove it. And in A, we could at most have one. And in B, we at most have one. Therefore, A or B is at most one literal. It could be at most two literals, sorry. Is this clear? So uh, A is at, at most one literal, B is at most one literal, A or B is at most two. So the number of literals in a clause does not grow if it is bounded by two. It could be one, it could be zero, this means we can get contradiction, but it's not, not more than two. And this means that saturation is really efficient. Because there is a global bound on the number of two bounded clauses, which is as follows. It's just, I begin just standard combinatorics. We'll read it from the, from the end. So n is the number of variables. We've got n variables. How many clauses can we have? We can have one clause, which is just false, which is the empty clause. We have two n one variable clauses, which means that, uh, why two n? Because it can be either x or not x. We have n positive and n negative. And for clauses which have two, well, this is a, a bit of course bound. We have 4n squared because it's 2n multiplied by 2n. Actually less because uh, if there are two copies of the same literal, the x or x, it's actually a one literal clause. We have to, we, we already counted it here in this 2n. Also, we have commutativity. If we have x or y, it's the same as y or x. It's just a gain by matter of commutativity. So we have to divide by two at some point. Uh, also, if we have x or not x, this clause is trivially true everywhere, so we can have also disregarded. But this is a coarse upper bound, and it's already polynomial square. We'll not get a linear one, so we don't have to worry about that. It's always going to be quadratic, but it's a polynomial upper bound. And therefore, Checking satisfiability for two CNF can be performed in polynomial time. So again, by now we do not give formal definitions. We uh, it's okay for us to think about uh, algorithms just informally. So we program our algorithms on um, say real life computers, and uh, polynomial time computability means that we have an algorithm whose running time is the number of steps it performs, which is the physical time it works is bounded globally by a polynomial on the size of the input data. So here the size of the input data is the number of variables we have, is n. So uh, the polynomial here is quadratic. It's not this polynomial, it's a bit bigger because uh, for each step of saturation is not just one step of computation, it's a constant number of steps. Or even a linear number of steps because in a, no, it's constant because it's uh, uh, re resolving over two we will discuss it in a bit more detail in our practical class, but you will see it. And now, so for uh, what is the gain we have obtained now using resolution method, that if we have a CNF with boundary two on the size of the clause, on the number of literals, we obtain a, a polynomial time algorithm. It's a new result. We didn't know it beforehand, because beforehand we had only algorithms which use uh, brute force over all satisfying assignments. Here we have something more clever. We have a clever st st stuff here. Now let us uh, make a bit of speculations about polynomiality. So traditionally, an algorithmic problem is considered sort of practically solvable, tractable, if, it, if there exists a polynomially bounded algorithm. So the number of steps, even in the worst case, is bounded by a polynomial of the length of the input. 
and uh, so the length of the input is just the size of the input in bits, and uh, P is a fixed polynomial. So it does not depend on the input. It's fixed for a concrete algorithm, and this is the measure of complexity of this algorithm, the upper bound. Of course, this is a very gross approximation. Suppose that the polynomial is power, a degree, I don't know, 100. It's not practically tractable in any way. And it's not, not in for all practical reasons, it's not much better than exponential. Why polynomiality? So in real practice, people usually wish, wish, wish much better complexity bounds. So say n logarithm n, like for sorting problem, it's normal. But here we have n square, which is sort of also okay. But uh, why not talking about, say, linear algorithms, quadratic algorithms, logarithmic algorithms, and stuff like that? Why should we uh, take this polynomiality as our basic thing? And the reason is that polynomiality is a robust notion. It's independent from details of the implementation, even from the computational model. So uh, if we uh, think about an algorithm being quadratic or, say, cubic or something like that, it heavily depends on the implementation. So when we try to think about how we really implement the uh, resolution method for 2CNF, we have many details. How do we represent our uh, uh, CNF? How do we... Uh, uh, perform all these resolutions? How do we take these elements from there? So well, what do we need to do for saturation? We need to, to take two clauses and resolve them. If we do it not in a clever way, if we don't have a good data structure for that, well, uh, this could add another n as a multiplier, because we make algorithm cubic. Why? Because we have to go along all this line of the clauses and find the two which we have to saturate. In the worst case, it could make even an, an extra n square. So these are all details of the implementation. Of course, people who do real programming, they should take care of that. But when we are doing theoretical estimations, when we are doing complexity estimations, we wish to uh, sort of take a bird eye view and do not go into these details. And polynomiality gives a good thing for that because it's independent of all these details. So the degree of the polynomial can grow, but uh, the polynomiality is still there. And for example, the problem is polynomial is solvable on a real computer with this good, say, uh, computational environment. If and only if it's polynomial is solvable even in the trivial computational model, which is a one tape Turing machine. We will discuss them in details later, but probably you've heard about them. So, what is a one tape Turing machine? All your memory is organized just as one row of bits. And you, in order to get access to one of them, you just have to move along it. So in ancient times, even real computers used such things, like magnetic tapes, where to get to your data, you should rewind it. So, of course, this uh, running along the tape is time consuming. And the degree of your polynomial will grow. So when on real say, a computer you can uh, access your data immediately, here in order to access it in the worst case, you will have to go along the, all the tape, which will give you a multiply of say n or even, even worse. So the degree of the polynomial could grow, but polynomiality still survives. So the degree is different. And as we have seen, we have two polynomial algorithms. We have the new one, which is satisfiability for 2CNF, this is resolution. And we also have satisfiability for DNF, which is this trivial algorithm which we discussed in the beginning of the class. So they are polynomial itself. In short, we say that these problems belong to complexity class P. So P is just for polynomial. But beware, the complexity class P is only for decision problems. So what has been a decision problem? It means that the result should be just one bit. So we have an input data. Yes or no? Yes. So yes or no questions. And this is class P. So there is a bigger class FP, which is function polynomial, which where the result could be an arbitrary string of bits also. But here is just a class P. What about satisfiability for CNFs? Or general, not two CNFs, but in general. By now, in the state of art of science, it's uh, unknown whether it is in P. So 
No polynomial algorithm is known for that. Again, by now, by yesterday, for example. But also there is no proof that it's not the case. Nobody knows how to prove that something is not in P. Here it's the case. However, it's highly unlikely that it is a polynomial. And the reason is as follows. So here we have this very, so complexity theory is a very strange science. Uh, usually in mathematics, well, computer science, theoretical computer science is sort of a specific branch of mathematics. Why? Because we usually we prove theorems about something which is used in computing. Uh, and uh, it is normal for a mathematician to have a model of uh, life or something, physics or biology or computing, and to prove rigid theories about it. And what we wish to prove, and this would make our complexity classes much more, say, look like standard mathematical classes. Okay, we have to show that, say, 2 CNF is in P. Satisfiability for CNF is not in P. And we could say that this is theorem. Unfortunately, it's unknown. So there is a substitute for that. A substitute is as follows. So there is a, it's highly unlikely that uh, it's, an, it's polynomial due to the following reason. There is a large class of similar problems, and we'll see some of them. And these problems are called the class NP. Uh, we'll define later, but uh, problems like searching for something, like searching for satisfying assignment, searching for, I don't know, some specific path in a graph, etc., etc., or a specific coloring of a graph. All these problems belong to class NP. And uh, this satisfiability for CNFs is, in some, in some sense, one of the hardest problems in this class. So if it, man it, it happens to be in P, then all these problems are going to be in P. But we don't know algorithm for most of them. And therefore, they are probably not in P. And so uh, we say that satisfiability for CNF is... Uh, we believe that it is not polynomial, but up to condition. The condition is that P is that the NP class is strictly larger than the P class. And this is the state of art. So these problems include subgraph isomorphism, the knapsack problem, some, some, some stuff like that. So uh, this makes uh, complexity theory a bit of not rigid science. It is quite unfortunate, say, for cryptography, because in cryptography, some of these, so in uh, usually people wish problems to be easily solvable, right? Because if you have a problem, you want to have an algorithm. In crypto, it's, the situation is different. We want to have our problems to be not easily solvable because the problem is to crack a, a, a cipher. If it's possible to do it efficiently, then the adversary could do it. If we manage to prove that it is impossible, we will have a theoretically validated uh, strong crypto system. But again, it's not possible to prove it. It's only modular sum conditions. So uh, that's about all for today's theoretical material. Uh, we have 10 minutes left. I think we'll, we'll talk about that five minutes and then we'll have a break. Uh, so what next? What about the, this course? So in the course, we shall develop the theory of NP problems and NP completeness and discuss related topics. So NP completeness is that substitute for being hard. So uh, the good thing, what we wish to have is to have to prove that it is hard, that it's uh, not polynomial, we fail to do this, and therefore we have a workaround. We show that it's, uh, well, maybe it's not hard, but at least it's as hard as many other problems. And we'll formally define this in the next lecture. We define related topics. The running examples will be connected as said to Boolean logic, also to graph theory, because graphs are everywhere and it's an important thing. Uh, and during the course, we'll highlight possible connections to applications in data analysis, as, uh, it, uh, again, up to the time we have. So um, that's all for the lecture. Uh, now I will, um, before see, questions and discussions, I will uh, say what is going to happen in other activities in the course. So this probably in the presentation of the course, which some of you heard, uh, I said that there will be three activities here. So the first one is theoretical lectures. So each morning and on Wednesday we'll have uh, 
uh, practical uh, theoretical classes like like today. So uh, all of you who are physically in Moscow are invited to. So I will say stop sharing. Um, so all of you who are physically in Moscow are invited to join the classes uh, physically. For those for whom it's impossible, they're invited to uh, join by Teams. I will do it each time. Uh, so um, the second activity is the seminar, which will happen um, directly after the lecture today. It's another class. They will solve just pen and paper style problems uh, connected to the topics we discuss on the classes. So say today we'll have Boolean logic and we'll practice in resolution method and all these translations between Boolean formula, formalizing something in Boolean formula. We'll have a graph, so we'll have some problems in graphs. Some of them will be discussed in class. Some of them will go to your home assignments. Well, it's not the officially graded home assignments. It's just for you to practice, to train yourself. And there will be a third of class activity. There will be three assignments which will contribute to your grades. So there will be one of them which will be a written theoretical midterm. So it's like the things we will discuss in class, in the practical, in the seminar class, and we'll have this in your, um, uh, in your, say, questionnaire. This is the first one. And uh, uh, it's, it's homework number two. And two other homeworks will be programming. So um, there will be one one programming homework which will be devoted to Boolean logic by basically the resolution method. And this will be handed out next week. So at the beginning of next week's lecture, I will show what is the problem, how to solve it, how to submit it. And there will be a GitHub classroom organized for that. So everything will be, uh, I will uh, tell all the details on the unit next class and also post the links on Teams and everywhere else. Uh, so, uh, and you will have a sort of long deadline for that. And the third home assignment will be also a programming one. It will be devoted to graphs and social network analysis on real, say, data sets from Facebook. Uh, but uh, so it will be say, more interesting, more say data science, but uh, since it will be in the end of the term, then it will be much easier. And it will contribute less grades to your final. So all these home assignments, they will give you this cumulative grade and this will form half of your final grade. And the other half is the written final exam, which will include practical problems and theoretical questions. Uh, it's uh, since the course, it has a big weight, uh, and uh, the course has a big theoretical part, it's uh, going to be obligatory for all the students attending the course. So no exceptions. It's uh, Everyone should pass the final exam. Um, so that's about all. All this stuff you should not, you don't need to memorize it by now. Uh, I didn't do it right now, but I will do it this week. I will uh, make a I may, maybe on your wiki system or on my home page, I will make a page for this course where all this information will be available. So what are home tasks, what are the grading scheme, uh, all these, uh, all the slides which are shown on the lectures will be there, all the problems for the practical classes will be posted there, and of course uh, all the things which you need to pass the course successfully.